lot faster. So all of a sudden, these four guys that were just our age uh, were like sophisticated, and they were very funny, and they had these wry sense of of humor. How do you find the United States? Turn left at Greenland. <laughs> And we're like, what? <laughs> how, how do they? T and they're smoking, and and they're just had these cosmopolitan, laid-back European. And back then, Europe was like Mars mm. to to kids in the United States, especially on the West Coast. You know, I remember Lonnie Donegan, and I and I, but that was about it. I mean, there was not much or sukiyaki from Japan. You know, what's ja where's Japan? Because <laughs> you get very isolated, especially in a country like the United States. So all of a sudden, to me, I remember the Beatles were like aliens. Like aliens with a different language, bird, fab, gear, what, and we're scribbling all like, you know, what, the, what is that? What is a bird? What, what if get, fab, get what? So it was slang, it was an attitude, it was a sense of humor. Uh, banter, repartee, which we had no clue. You know, you told a joke, usually a dirty one. That was <laughs> that was humor and comedy for the most part. Um, so of course, uh, we were all very impressed. So I go over for this press junket, and this is about the time, if I'm not mistaken, when we had our big kerfuffle with the uh, uh, record producers and Donnie Kirshner and all that, about trying to at least have something to say about what was going on in the music. Wanted more control of the songwriting and the production and, and, and so forth. The album cover, you know, the, the liner notes. We had absolutely no input at all. Not what was going to be uh, written and sung, who was going to sing it, you know, nothing. And Mike, especially, being, uh, you know, got very, very frustrated. Uh, I tell the story about different drum. Everybody's heard that one. And he, he almost quit, he says. He, he was like, you know, I, I, I got into this to sing and play. And they're, well, yeah, don't worry about it. Just, you know, shut up and sit down, kind of, you know. Thing. Peter talks about going to one of the early sessions with his bass guitar, and they said, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> so as <clears throat> musicians, singers, songwriters, I can imagine that, that especially Mike, was terribly, terribly frustrated. Anyway, we had our callous, uh, our palace revolt. We had our little coup. And <clears throat> uh, I was supposed to go to New York to sing uh, a song that I believe was Sugar Sugar. That was going to be the next monkey, monkey single. And Mike and we all talked and, we, uh, and agreed, no, we can't go back in the studio until we get this sorted out. So I jumped on a plane and went to London, and it was uh, starting to set up for a tour over there. And uh, the publicist must have got together and said, hey, uh, Paul McCartney wants you to come over to his house. And I nearly fell on the floor. I mean, <laughs> and I got my autograph book, <laughs> and I, I put That's it funny. in my pocket. Thank God I never took it out. That would be <laughs> embarrassing. And I'm trying to be so cool, you know. Oh, yeah, Paul McCartney. And I show up at Abbey Road. Uh, uh, not at Abbey Road. Um, what was that? Studio? EMI Studios. Maida Vale. Oh. The, the house in, in Maida Vale with the big sheep dog. And, he, and I think Mal Evans was there. I think Mal, uh, you know, some other people in his entourage. And I think one or two people from mine. But it was very small. Little. We had some dinner, and then we watched television. And, you know, just sort of... Uh, got together and, you know, had a good time. And just talking about, you know, stuff. And he invited me, uh, he, so he was the first Beatle that, that I met, but he invited me to uh, uh, Abbey Road Studios the next day or, or so to come in and, uh, and uh, come to a session. I don't know how far you want me to get into this, it's, but... <clears throat> uh, Keep going, right? A lot, uh, <laughs> yeah. peop, a, a lot of people... Uh, I've heard this story. Um, I, I don't know what I was expecting. I guess some kind of crazy beetle mania, love in, freak out, psycho jello <laughs> thing. So I uh, 
got dressed up accordingly in my tie-dyed underwear and my paisley bell bottoms and I had my hair all up and linen glasses and I was feeling no pain, shall we say. <clears throat> and a Daimler, Princess Daimler, Lam uh, Daimler limo picks me up at like two o'clock in the afternoon or something in the middle of the day, drops me off all by myself. I walk in, nobody there except the four guys sitting in folding chairs in just jeans and, and t-shirts. Looked like my high school gymnasium, all just fluorescent lighting. And I'm like, where are the girls? <laughs> <coughs> John, uh, uh, George Martin, up in the booth in that studio over at Abbey Road, Studio 2, uh, in a three-piece suit at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I think you had to do that if you were staff or uh, you know, my staff. And just the four guys. And I'm just speechless. I mean, I don't know. I'm trying so hard to make an ass out of myself. But I already had by showing up in <laughs> paisley underwear. <laughs> And I'm, and I never forget. Um, John looks up and says, "Hey, monkey man." <laughs> That's what he called me. It's better than monkey boy. Um, yeah, right. From then on, it was ah, monkey man. <laughs> Terrible accent that I'm sorry, but uh, you want to hear what we're working on? And I'm. Uh, I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be cool. I'm going, oh, far out, John. Yeah, right on, man. That's cool, yeah. And he points up to George Martin, and George Martin hits the, the button on a four-track tape recorder, and I hear, good morning, good morning, uh, the tracking of it, and I think a, a scratch vocal or something like that. And I, we listen, and then, <laughs> then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, Tea time, lads. <clears throat> and this guy from the EMI, uh, whatever, comes in in a tie and a white, you know, long uh, service coat with a tray of tea. And we sit around a little tea table. And, and again, I'm trying so hard not to wee my pants, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, oh, what's it like being a monk? And um, we have tea. And I'm not kidding, like 20 minutes later like that, Lennon says, right, lads, back, back to work. Right down the mines, right back down the mines. I mean, that was the, in retrospect, that's what, you know, and I've heard stories also since then that he was really like a slave driver about it. I mean, he was very serious about it. And they are northern lads, and they were like back down the mines, you know. And then I started to realize how they could have possibly come up with that library of material in a relatively very short time is there was no bullshitting around and it was like down the mines every day like that it was a fascinating uh, experience so I uh, we hung out they threw us a party one night at the speakeasy and were the other monkeys there at this point yeah I think so and I be uh, <laughs> I I'm told I had a great time <laughs> I vaguely remember moments of that night. Uh, John, I know, was there. I remember him, definitely. I believe that Mick was there. I think Eric Clapton uh, or, and some people. And, you know, most of the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, Brian uh, Jones, I think, I'm pretty sure was there. It was a big turnout and a big party, and I frankly do not remember a whole lot about it. Um, some of the aftermath I do. Um, but uh, over the years, yeah, we, you know, we started to hang out. You know, the, the Beatles, um, uh, in a funny way, the British, uh, uh, from my perspective, my point of view, because I moved over there years later and started living there, they got it. They got what the monkeys was all about way before people in the States, especially the hip as I call them. And... Uh, in the States, as everyone knows, we got a lot of crap about it, mainly because people just did not get what it was, because it never happened before. Little crossover in television and music with Ricky Nelson, but 
just that, that much. Never before had there, be, had there been this concerted assault on the consumer. <clears throat> but ultimately, and I didn't even figure this out until years later, the Monkees was much more like the Marx Brothers than the Beatles. And it was John Lennon was the first one I ever heard say that before I, I, it even occurred to me. The Monkees was a television show about a band, an imaginary band, that wanted to be the Beatles. We never made it on the television show, and it's an important it's an important point. We were always trying for the success. So it was that struggle for success that I think helped endear it to, to all those kids. We wanted to be the Beatles. We had a poster of the Beatles in the set that we'd throw darts at. <laughs> and <clears throat> so some people got it. Some people that mattered to me, John, uh, the other Beatles, um, Frank Zappa got it. Andy Warhol came up to me once and was like, good going, I, you know, I get it. I really get it. Uh, Timothy Leary wrote uh, two or three pages in his book, Politics of Ecstasy, uh, about the monkeys and bringing long hair in the living room and all that. And you know, you mentioned, you mentioned the Marx Brothers. I think it was, uh, it's pretty common knowledge that Harpo was the quiet Marx brother. Yep. Yeah, like George is the quiet Beatle. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, uh, Peter, uh, when, since Peter and Gordon were going strong for those uh, years following the British invasion, were you still in the inner circle with the Beatles uh, and with all of the British bands? I'm trying to think what, you, what, what period that was. Was I at Apple then? I, I, no, well, 66 and 67, Sergeant Pepper kind of is what Peter... Uh, yes, no, Sergeant Pepper, I mean, Paul was still living in our house. Um, so, yes, I mean, we would get to hang out quite a lot, yes. Waiting for Paul to scratch up enough money to get his own place? It's a good question. Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, it's probably the easiest thing. And I was still having to look for someone to live. But he did buy the house in Cavendish Avenue, St. John's Wood, um, while he was there. And then, of course, moved in. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, I didn't go to the sessions that often. I'm still trying to figure out how I missed that party. But I, I wasn't, <laughs> for some reason, I wasn't at the speakeasy for that party. I don't know why not. And I was at the speakeasy most nights, so that's kind of weird. Um, I but, spent two <laughs> years there one night. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, know, I mean, no, I probably, I wouldn't consider myself part of the inner circle. The inner, but the inner circle has always really been them and Neil and Mal and a couple of kind of childhood friends and not much else. You know, they kept themselves to themselves. But I did have the privilege of hearing some songs and, and you know, hanging out and having dinner from time to time. Did, did Paul compose yesterday Cause he, in, in your family yes, home? Because he talks he about getting out of bed and running to a piano. Yes, he so, did. So were you aware of that? I was away at that time. First person to hear yesterday was my mother, actually. Because you, you probably know the story, but Paul woke up with the melody completely written in mm -hmm. his head um, and thought, was convinced that it was an existing song. It was, so he wasn't going around singing it to people going, look what I've written. He was going around singing it to people saying, what is this? You know, what, what song is this? It's in my head. And um, my mother, who's fairly extensive knowledge of classical music that she certainly didn't know it. And then he finally played it to George Martin and other Beatles and they went, no, I think, I think you invented it. You know, nobody knows what it is. But it's the only time it happened to him, evidently, was that he woke up with the tune completely written in his dream, obviously, and he woke up fully formed in his head. No lyrics. That's where that whole scrambled egg story and all mm -hmm. that stuff comes in. But, but the, the melody was just done, um, which just goes to reinforce the fact we all know to be true it that even when you write a song very deliberately, you still don't know where it really comes from. I mean, nobody does. Where, how people sit down and come up with a song, consciously or unconsciously, is one of the mysteries of life. You know, people just do come up with amazing songs. And you'd think there wouldn't be any notes left at this point, but there are. <laughs> people still manage to come up with brilliant new melodies all the time. So since we have Britain meets America here, did you feel that there was a competition or did you feel like we're all rising to the top, having this success as an American artist and as a British artist? Well, initially, no, we, we for, for, for whatever reason, it looked to us like suddenly the British were taking over because, because we were, you know, I mean, that was what had happened was that America sucked in uh, this whole British invasion thing with such enthusiasm. Um, 
But then, um, and of course, the monkeys were away that it came bouncing back to us. And you're absolutely right. We loved the monkeys the minute we saw it and heard it. And we didn't expect to. As I've talked about, we all thought, oh, this is going to be really bogus, you know, where they're doing a kind of Beatle rip-off kind of, you know, Dick Lester imitation editing kind of thing because we'd heard about it before we saw it. But when we saw it and heard it, the songs were great, the, the, the cast was great, the show was funny, and it was the kind of humor that appealed to us, which is kind of Marx Brothers-ish humor, combined with our version of that, which was kind of Spike Milligan, Peter Sellers, because um, we loved all that. And so we became huge, huge Monkeys fans immediately. Um, but in general, there was a period when, Ameri when American music did seem to be taking a back seat, even though it was the music we all loved. We were buying American R&B records that the Americans weren't buying, you know. And a lot of the cover songs that everybody did, you know, when Moody Blues did Go Now, or the Animals did House of the Rising Sun, or, or the Beatles did Money, or any of those songs, half the time, Americans were hearing them for the very first time. They didn't know House of the Rising Sun. They didn't know Go Now. They didn't know Money. They didn't even know Twist and Shout half the time. You'd be amazed how many people thought that was a Beatles song. But so we were essentially reminding America of the incredible musical heritage you had already and still have. So Mickey, did you appreciate the British music that was coming in, much like Brian Wilson was in competition with the Beatles for Pet Sounds, for Sgt. Pepper, back and forth? Did you feel a, a spurt of creativity and, and energy after hearing them? I'm not sure competition is the right word. Um, uh, it, it, there was so much to go around uh, at the time. They, the charts, it was music was just huge. Uh, the charts were huge, and always had been in the states. You know, the, very diverse the charts, um, always um, until way, way later, decades later, when they started uh, being more specific. But there was no separate country chart, R and B chart, this chart, that chart. There was the top forty, and you could have the Beatles and Sinatra and Pat Boone, and uh, Eric Burden and the Monkees, and then Doris Day, uh, <clears throat> for a period of two or three years there, um, it, the, the charts were all over the place, and uh, you know the Green Beret or, or or something, and so I never felt personally like there was any any personal competition. I think that the competition, the level of competition, would have come from the uh, record company executives and the distributors and the rack jobbers and the and the people that were actually trying to to get the stuff on the radio, and it was it was tricky. I mean, uh, the the record business at the time, as you've all heard, was shall we say slightly nefarious at times. Um, I don't know how, what it was like in England, how that whole payola thing uh, went down in England, but didn't exist because we only had one radio station. That's that was the true. BBC. <laughs> 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 That's true. But in the States, it's common knowledge. You know, you had to know the right people. You had to pay the right people. You had to go up the chain. You have to work your way up the chain of, uh, you know, uh, the command through all these, uh, the, the, the rack drivers, distributors, the promoters, the record company, the disc jockeys. And it's one of the reasons why I think that uh, the monkeys um, uh, did get a lot of shtick, a lot of you don't mind me saying crap, um, because, and I learned this later on, years later, because I talked to some uh, people from record companies, and this one guy said, yeah, we were pissed off because you didn't need us. It was the first time that, some, that a group had sort of just shot over, <laughs> just... <laughs> Uh, shot over the, the whole process, the whole uh, the mechanism of getting a hit record. These radio stations and record stores, who had a lot of power, a lot of power, mm -hmm. they had no choice. That show came on the air Monday night, and the next day, literally millions of, of kids were going down to yeah. the record stores all over the country, all over the world, and saying, we want the monkey record, we want the monkey record, we want... And so they did, it had usurped all of that power and those disc jockeys and those record company executives and the radio station program directors had to play the, the monkey songs. And of course they were just pissed off at the four of us. <laughs> 
Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask Scott to talk to um, Peter about his involvement with Apple and James Taylor. Yes, and yes. So I'm particularly interested. You know, um, Peter was. You helped birth the singer-songwriter movement, I would think, between in a way, yes, James Taylor and, and, of course, Linda Ronstadt and so forth. But producing James Taylor for Apple in England and then coming over to America and producing him here, what were the differences? Did you have more freedom at one place versus the other? Um, was the, uh, the style of engineering and production different, did you find? Uh, no. Uh, the freedom, there was the complete freedom in both cases. Because... I mean, I was head of A&R for the label. If anyone was going to interfere, it would have been me interfering with me. So, so um, no, I, I, the, but the records themselves are incredibly different, but not because of the location of the recording. In both cases, I had an excellent engineer and a great studio and could do whatever I wanted. The difference was that on that first album, um, I was determined to to make people take James seriously. My concern was, they're gonna go, oh, it's another long-haired folk singer. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of them, we've seen it, done that. So, if anything, I think I ended up kind of over overproducing the record slightly because, as you may remember, if others of you have heard it, it, there's a string quartet on this track and some brass on this track and a percussion break and little links between the songs and all kinds of clever stuff that I was trying to do so people would go, oh, I should listen to this, it's different. Um, and maybe in, in, in retrospect, I think perhaps I overdid it slightly. So, but it, I still like the record, but, and I James sounds so incredibly young. He yes, sounds he about, does. Yes, sounds he about does. 10 years old, yeah. it's amazing. Um, but then by the time we did the second record um, in America, first of all, yes, I was exciting to be doing it in America because we all thought American records and, sounded and what, better. What studio did you use? Sunset that? Sound. Uh, an engineer called Bill Lazarus at Sunset Sound on Sunset Boulevard. We would rehearse in my house every day because uh, first thing I did was cast the record, um, as it were. Um, I still hadn't found my ideal bass player. I found, just after we'd made the album, we found this bass player called Lee Sklar, who I was lucky enough to have playing in my band, if any of you saw the couple of band shows, um, who then became James Taylor's bass, bass player for many, many years. He's a genius. But hadn't found him before Sweet Baby James. I'd found Danny Korchmar, who was James and my friend. He was going to play guitar. By this time, I'd met Carol King, and who, as soon as I got to LA, she was one of the people I really wanted to meet. And I, not only that, but I'd heard Carole King's demos of her songs, the version she'd done of all these classic songs before they got recorded. And the Screen Gems had all these demos. And I loved her piano playing. So I'd said to Carole when I met her, look, I'm a huge fan, blah, blah, blah. Would you consider playing on this record I'm about to do with this unknown singer-songwriter? Because I think your style of piano playing would be perfect. So she agreed. And I, she came over to my house the next day, met James, and they started playing together, and it was magical. So she was going to play piano on the album. I found a drummer called Russ Kunkel, who's an amazing drummer who went on to become the studio guy in L.A. At this point, he'd never been in a recording studio at all. Wow. He was playing live in John Stewart's band. I know this is a little convoluted, but John Stewart is the man who wrote... Um, uh, which one? The After Me. The, no, no, no. No, John Stewart wrote um, the Monkey Song. Oh, 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 oh Daydream Day Believer. Day I always I get the muddle, I muddle up Daydream Believer and I'm a believer. One's Neil Diamond and one's John Stewart. But but uh, yeah, Daydream Believer was written by John Stewart. Coincidentally, I went to a John Stewart rehearsal. Someone introduced me to him. Heard this drummer called Russ Kunkel, thought he was great, and and booked him for the session. I said, Would you come play on this James Taylor album? And John Stewart held it against me forever that I'd stolen his drummer, which essentially I did. Because after that record came out, Russ became the most in-demand drummer in L.A. And we couldn't go on the road with John anymore because John couldn't afford him. So the, the, John was a little pissed off about that. But, um, and that was the band. And so the second record we did very simply. We rehearsed three songs in my house in the afternoon, went in the studio at night and cut them. The album took a week. Wow. cost $7,000. Wow. Um, wow. And... Uh, and we actually felt guilty because, you know, we, with the deal I'd made, this is more than you wanted to know, I know. The deal I made with Warner Brothers was that we got $20,000 up front and 20000 when we delivered a finished album. And we, we got the money up front, which we spent, because we had no money whatsoever. So we spent that, you know, on stuff, and we had rented a house and all this. And, and uh, we actually felt guilty when we got the record finished for only $7,000. But, but, we but we'd run out of money. So we really needed to deliver the record and, and, and collect the back end, as they call it. And um, James came to me towards the end of the recording and said, uh, I've run out of songs. We, I haven't got anything else to, to, to record. 
you know, we can't finish the record. And I went, but you, I'm, you were working on these three really cool tunes, you know, can't, let's finish one of them. And he went, well, I've been trying, but they, they don't seem to be want to get any longer than they are. They're all just fragments. So I said, can you play them to me? So he played me the three separate fragments. And I said, they're all great. So just string them together, you know, join them up. <laughs> and and uh, so he did. Uh, he, he tied them all together. And, and uh, it's the only James Taylor song I ever named because he said, well, what do we call it? And I said, well, we'll put, we're stringing them together so we can collect our $20,000. So call it Sweet for 20G. So <laughs> if you... <laughs> if you if you look on the record, there's a song called Sweet for 20G, and people, people have ascribed all kinds of mystical meanings to it. It, 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 it was just about collecting our money. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Asher, Mickey Dolenz, and Scott Fryman. Thank you, you guys you very have much. been awesome. Would you guys stand for a picture?